This live presentation was produced in Ashland, Oregon by the Rogue Valley Metaphysical Library and Event Center. RVML relies on the support of our volunteers, members, and donors to organize and present these programs. For more information about this presentation or to borrow, download, or purchase other recordings from our catalog, please visit our website at rvml.org. I um, have been up and working in front of groups for 25 years, and I find that it's been years since I've been nervous, and I'm quite nervous. Uh, I don't understand it, but it'll pass. Um, I like to begin and end um, my conversations with a poem. In my uh, orientation, all poetry is uh, is a prayer. And so I want to hear from um, Theodore Rothke tonight. I was introduced to him when I once saw a quote of his, uh, someone quoted a line from one of his poems, and, and he said that, uh, or what I read was, what is madness but nobility of soul at odds with circumstance? What is madness but nobility of soul at odds with circumstance? So I wanted to read uh, Rothke, and here's a uh, a poem I want to share with you. Near the rose, in this grove of sun-parched, wind-warped madrones, among the half-dead trees, I came upon the true ease of myself, as if another person appeared out of the depths of my being, and I stood outside myself, beyond becoming and perishing, a something wholly other, as if I swayed out of the wildest wave alive, and yet was still, and I rejoiced in being what I was. And I rejoiced in being what I was. So, my business partner, Marina McDonald, and I talked, uh, talked over the topic for this evening, and it was decided that we should do an evening on relationships. And the first thought that went through my head is, who am I to stand in front of others and talk about relationships? And I, as I thought about this, this conversation tonight, I realized I couldn't write anything until I uh, had a conversation with my partner. And I realized that she and I had had to clean up some of our absences in our communication. And as soon as that was done, I became clear on our conversation here tonight. And so, um, so we'll get started on this topic of, of relationship. But, and, and we'll work our way through relationship from the perspective of this business of family constellations. In other words, this business of what enables or supports movement of the soul and what impedes it. Some of the, the work of Bert Hellinger, which is an approach for change within ind individuals or change within families that is not psychological. But in, instead, it, it affects us at deeper aspects of our being. And I think that there is a lot in that work to assist us with relationships, both in a, a primary sense, with primary relationships, but, but perhaps even more profoundly with a relationship with ourself and then relationship with all others. So um, a couple weeks ago, I was home visiting my, my parents and my brothers um, traveled there also. And, my brother made a comment. He said a friend of his had been working with a young couple from India and that uh, they'd gotten together and, and went out for dinner. And the couple were quite enamored of one another. And so this man asked, um, how did you meet one another? And the woman responded, we didn't. 
we had had an arranged marriage, and we met uh, during our wedding ceremony after we were married. And I thought, that certainly I get myopic in my, my thoughts about what constitutes relationship or marriage. And then I was reminded of reading Maladoma Somme some years ago when his father had told him that it had taken him 40 years to, to fall in love with Maladoma's mother. And I thought, there is hope. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I think in the West, in this country specifically, and we're certainly used to um, having the ethic of romance be present when we initiate a relationship uh, with a potential partner. Um, and yet, the world is not that way at all. And so yet, no matter whether we begin a relationship with de designs of, of passion or someone um, as a, a man I was working with once said, he said, well, I want a woman who's presentable. Whether we want someone who's presentable or we want someone who's a good parent, whatever our criteria are, there's a place or a time in that relationship, if we stay in them long enough, wherein we perhaps we need to make a shift. Um, uh, who was it? Joseph Campbell, who said something like, "There's a there's a time when we have to shift from the physical relationship to the spiritual." It doesn't mean that this, the physical relationship ends, but we attend to something a little different than what our strategic mind or our personality or our ego wants. And what is it that the self who we truly are wants and what is being asked for, asked for here? So what I hope for tonight is to begin a conversation and then open, it up, open this up for interaction fairly soon so that if there are comments or questions, we can build this thing together. Um, agreeable to you? Yeah. And what it means, whoever's working the microphone will maybe start her role earlier. Thank you. To, um, to press on, I think I will, I will start first with a little bit of this some of the, the patterns that are revealed in family constellations. Uh, briefly, I don't know. Firstly, are there people in here who've done constellations or have read about or know about this process? Oh, good many of you. So actually, I'll be extremely brief. That um, a German therapist noticed patterns with, with his clients and the pattern that he perceived was the issues they presented were not psychological. They were, in his initial perception, they had to deal with um, the system. Something is going on, and this, this person is bringing an issue forward that um, is related to, to uh, occurrences that existed before this, this child was even born or this person was even born. And so he. He followed this trajectory for a number of years, and, and his body of work is now out in the world. And it, even though it's being um, marketed and people are being trained as though this were psychotherapy, my personal perspective is that it's, it's actually more spiritual work, because it works with a deeper part of who we are. But in this, in this process, um, we have people, people come to me and they say, well, I have this problem. and then. Then, if I'm working with a group, I would have different group members stand in and, and represent certain people in the family. And there are patterns that are born out of what, what the constellation reveals. In other words, what the soul of the family brings forward. And what it brings forward, firstly and foremost, is there seems to be an imperative, a systemic imperative to balance giving and taking uh, within all members of the family. And what that refers to in couples or in a coupleship is that there's an imperative when one person gives love to the relationship 
there's an imperative that the, the other person in this relationship take the love that's given and then give back in equal share. And that begins to maintain a balance. However, the, the rub is that quite often, due to unconscious systemic entanglements, unconscious identifications, in other words, a difficulty that one or the other part of the partners is having, there is an inability to either to give the love to the, to the other or to the relationship, or an inability to take that love in return. Or perhaps if they can take it, they can take some of it but cannot give equally in return. And when that occurs, there's an imbalance or uh, a distance that begins in the relationship. Similarly with, with parents and children, the imperative to have love move through the family system is that the parents give love to the children and the children take that love. Quite typically, um, something arises, it seems like none of us are exempt, and uh, one of the children or several of the children will not take the love. And with that um, typically unwitting refusal to take the love, then the child doesn't, doesn't feel the strength or the love in the family. They might understand intellectually that they're loved, but they don't feel loved. And then there, there's less stability for them. So there seems to be an imperative of balancing giving and taking. Additional ways the, the uh, balance of give and taking occurs involve suffering of those in your family or those who came before you, your ancestry. And the, the way that a suffering is honored or acknowledged is with a full heartfelt um, grief and gratitude rather than an intellectual acknowledgement. And that doesn't come so easily for a lot of us. We're trained that um, what's important is what's, what goes on up here. And so we don't always allow ourselves to go into the experience of our heart, whether it's a grief or a joy. And so these, there, these imperatives for balancing giving and taking, when we are able and we, we know of the need to balance, love moves more freely. So I often use the, the metaphor that we can think of the, con the ancestry as a conduit through which love flows from the mystery to the family. And that when there's, there are, is a balance of giving and taking within that system, the love can flow very freely through that conduit. When the, when the elders or the ones who came before are honored and, and acknowledged, or when the love is taken from, taking from the parents. So there's, there's this imperative of balancing giving and taking. Now there is another imperative, and that involves consenting to what is. And this language is quite specific, consenting to what is. Oftentimes, we think in terms of accepting or rejecting an idea or a, a behavior or something that's going on, some circumstance in the family. Well, I don't agree, so I reject that. Well, to accept something or to reject it, um, if, if there is an event happening in the family and we say we, we don't accept it, it's still present. We really cannot reject it. By consenting to what is, we simply acknowledge the existence of the reality of the circumstance or the event. And as we acknowledge the existence of the event, there's no more resistance within us. No more desire in that, in that moment to have something other than what is. And with the, seemingly with the absence of the resistance, then reality itself begins to change. So how does that play out in a relationship? 
how does that play out with your partner consenting to what is? Well, in some respects, it plays out very straightforwardly in, say, there's, there's giving to the partnership and giving to the partnership and giving to the partnership, and yet one partner doesn't um, take what's given or doesn't give in return. Or perhaps that partner has um, made an agreement for X number of months to do such and such but fails to do it. The, we're, we're referring to the imbalance here. Part of acknowledging what is, is approaching your partner and stating your experience. Acknowledging what is in this respect. Um, you and I have had this agreement. Uh, and I have, uh, lately I've been feeling frustrated because for six months now you said you would do such and such. And it isn't done. And I want you to know that I'm, I'm feeling um, troubled. I'm feeling um, like I'm entitled to something here. I'm entitled, I'm entitled to the follow through and I'm not getting it. But to acknowledge what is in such a way where there's a response, where there is no indictment, just the stating of what is, so that there's room for a response. So I've mentioned this business of balancing giving and take and consenting to what is. There's another, another dynamic, a pattern that re repeats itself in family systems, and it has to do with place and hierarchy. When couples get into a relationship, they share the same level of the hierarchy. And their older siblings come before them, their parents come before them. And when this couple gets into the relationship, then they will have their first child, their second child, their third child, etc. And thus there's a hierarchy, the ancestry and this couple. Have you ever been in a relationship where you've you felt that you don't share the same level of the hierarchy with your partner? That one has made him or herself larger or above the other? The the imperative is that we each take our place in the hierarchy. And that this business of place seems very fundamental. What's also being revealed in this systems work is that there is an imperative for the feminine to serve the mas I'm sorry, for the masculine to serve the feminine. The masculine serves the feminine. Now, it doesn't matter whether that masculine energy um, is more dominantly possessed or expressed by a woman or a man, but the, the masculine energy is always in service to the feminine. Have you ever known, well, let's keep this simple firstly, men who use their, their, their masculine energy in service to themselves rather than their spouse or their family? Has that ever happened? <laughs> Never. The, this business of place is something that I think has um, largely eluded us. It seems to be what, what these, the family constellations reveal when we, when we open um, the soul of a family when we're doing this work. What comes forward is this imperative to acknowledge place. And it begins with acknowledging the soil of your birth. Those of you who were, who were born abroad and now live here, unless in your soul you also bring your native country, you don't have the strength that you would have had you brought that native country with you. Those of us who um, may have been born in this country, but who uh, have been so uh, vehemently opposed to the politics, when we reject the politics, have we inadvertently reject our country as well? And therefore, not acknowledged our place. There are times when I've done workshops simply uh, on this business of our place in relationship to the earth. 
and we can, we can feel a connection to our earth or to our nation, irrespective of whether we support the, the politics or not. So this business of place, again, our connection with place, with, with the earth, has everything to do with our own strength. What's also being revealed in this work is this business of place within our family and how imperative that is. For example, um, parents give love to a child. Perhaps there's, there's some circumstance that went on in the family where the child um, uh, didn't feel that he or she got what um, she wanted. And what often happens, then there's a, a rejection of the love that's coming from the parents. And the child in a, unconsciously places herself above or higher than the parents. When, when that occurs, the child may know she's intellectually know that she's loved, but she won't feel it. And the stabilizer that she has to keep her feeling well in the family and keep her feeling well in her life is arrogance. It's not love. When one is in one's place, what transpires is that there is a feeling of being loved. And with that feeling of being loved, there's a stability and a strength to move forward. So let me bring this back a little bit to this business of arranged marriages. In this country, we have as many arranged marriages as the East or as India. They're arranged not by your parents, but by your personality, your ego, instead of your deeper self. And when one is in one's place within their family, there's uh, an easier connection to their own heart, to the clarity, such that the criteria that their personality uses to sort partnership is different than one who's not connected or feeling in their place. This business of being in place within one's family has a lot to do with the ease of moving into one's place within your own heart, within your own deeper knowing. Now, it's said that many of us in the West never awaken to something truly more deep in ourselves. In this, in this poem, something, the line was, um, between becoming and perishing, I came across something wholly other. This something wholly other is awakening to something beyond your personality, beyond the identity you constructed for yourself, beyond your strategic self. And to me, that has to do with opening to your own heart. And as we open to our own heart, then we begin to understand a wholly other kind of relationship where we can make those transition out of the, the romantic aspect of a relationship and into um, a, committed, a committed human love, which involves loyalty and caring and support. So if I may, I'd, the, with the microphone, I'd like to, uh, I want to open this up and get some conversation. and. And then um, go back into some of the, the conversation with the, the constellation work. So thoughts, questions?
Doesn't sound like it. It's green. Try that. No? Yeah, that's better. So what was coming up for me just now when you were speaking was a sensation of um, a necessity to also fully separate from your family on a certain level. And I'm wondering if that's maybe because some of the maybe taking place isn't in at the level that you're talking about where the taking the place or the seat or however you language it might be more about just the shoulds and another level of ego identification. Well, I'm my father's daughter, or I'm my mother's daughter, and this is what I'm supposed to do, and I should do this and do that. And so there's kind of a false sense of connection to the ancestry and the lineage. And so it may be because it speaks to my own personal journey, but I'm wondering if there's a level at which there also needs to be a disidentification and then a more authentic connection into the love of the ancestry rather than the particular personalities in the ancestry. So I'm wondering if you could just talk about that a little bit. Does that make sense? Are you clear on what she's asking? Have you heard her? Yeah. If I understand what you're asking, you're asking me to make a distinction between um, taking our place in our family versus um, distancing ourselves by disidentifying with our family. Am I correct? Or maybe taking our place without um, it looking like a should or an expectation while releasing the expectations from the lineage, the ancestry, the, the personality of the lineage as opposed to the authentic vibration of the lineage or heart of the lineage. Well, I'm not sure I'm clear, um, but I will relate what I think I'm clear on. The. Uh, A friend asked me recently, she said um, she was, had some conversation there. I overheard some conversation between she and her husband. And um, she said, what do you think? And I said, do you want me to tell you the truth? And she said, yes. And I said, I think you're being arrogant. And she said, that's, that's odd. I would never have thought of myself as being arrogant. And I, I said, <clears throat> What if I were to propose to you right now that your, your mother is standing in front of you and that what I would ask you to do is prostrate yourself to your mother and honor her for giving you the gift of life? And this woman laughed. She said, that's ridiculous. I couldn't do it. And I said, that's arrogant. And so there may be times that in the process of our becoming, it may be necessary for a child to get some distance from his or her parents or his or her family. That's a psychological level. But there's a much deeper level. There's a level of the soul of the family. And for a child to take one's place, whether she's young or old or he's young or old, it literally involves open-heartedly either literally or figuratively, prostrating yourself to your parent and honoring them for giving you the gift of love. And when one can do that with a fully open heart, what they do is they shift their fidelity from the lesser truth of the frustration or the pain or the anger from an from an act or omission that the parents committed or didn't commit, shifting their faithfulness from that lesser truth to the larger truth of love. Because in the, in the, the work that I do, when a child is conceived, love is born. Parent, uh, children receive love from their parents when they're born, whether they've ever seen their parents or not. And then when they have children, they pass that love on. That's one of the ways love finds its way to the planet. And so when you ask me to speak of this, I understand that there are times when we have to have distance. But all too often, we take our distance, and that's how we stay. And our support then is arrogance. 
And I don't mean arrogance always is, is solely pejorative. It is a resource. It's stabilizing us. It helps us. It keeps us in place until such time we, we have the courage to begin opening to love. Yeah. So uh, there's a question here. I'll take it. Actually, this isn't a question. It's an experience of what you just said. Thank you. I um, moved across the country because I couldn't get along with my mom because I didn't feel myself with her. But when she died slowly and withdrew her energy from those surface things, and she she needed her she needed care, and she also needed well, no, she she needed she didn't need to worry about me anymore. That was it. She had no energy for that, um, and I could draw clothes. Then I could actually feel my heart just going out into this. Um, respect, appreciation, but you, I call it union. You call it prostration. I called it union to the being that she was. Same. But the gift was that she revealed the being that she was. She, you know, the social niceties are gone, and she told the truth even if it felt weird to me because I was trying to be nice or something in that moment. And then she also transcended the dimensions and gave us the gift of saying what that was. So um, all, I, all I can say is the truth of what you've just said is, is a profound experience. Yes, it is. And I've never thought, of, I'm the youngest, so I hadn't thought of the, all that, but the union was a gift. And you could bow to your older siblings and be even stronger in your place. There's, before I pass this on, there's one other thing you said that's really relevant. Um, she stopped being nice and started saying the truth. That, that is a part of consenting to what is, is stating the truth, the truth of your experience without blame or judgment. And we'll loop back around through that. You had something? Uh, would you address the whole issue of uh, incest uh, and sexual abuse in families? From the perspective of this work? Yes. She asks that I address the issue of incest and sexual abuse in families. Um, the patterns are quite clear. Uh, when there is sexual abuse. And it has to do with maintaining a balance of give and take. And so within, within the soul of a family, there are these, what Hellinger called orders of love, what we might call rules or patterns. Patterns of, um, patterns of entanglements patterns of unconscious identifications with other people in the family. For, and the, these patterns or these orders of love exist to preserve the integrity of the whole system. Oftentimes, and, and one of the orders of love is the system's imperative to balance giving and taking. What this work has revealed around incest, um, suppose there's a, a daughter in the family and um, there's incest between she and her father. What the, what the system reveals repeatedly is that there, there is an imbalance in the system, that the, the father is entangled in some way where he doesn't have access to strength, and that there's an unwitting collaboration between the daughter, the father, and the mother, wherein the, the daughter Unwitting, unconsciously, the mother offers up the daughter, and unwittingly, the daughter does this in service to the mother to balance the system. And the healing, the healing statement is a statement from the child to the father, if, if the father is the offender. You've wronged me. I'm innocent, and I love you. And after that statement is made, 
bo the, both the father and the mother make the, the statement, I've wronged you. The guilt is mine. You are innocent. Leave the burden with me. I offer you my remorse. Feel the energy just when I say that? This is... It is a balancing of giving and taking. In other words, taking the responsibility and the burden back from the child. It is stating and consenting to what is. This is what's true. I've wronged you. The burden is mine. The guilt is mine. Leave it with me. You're innocent. Is this on? I'll try it. Yeah, but in many cases, it's not as simple because uh, most of the abuser is in denial. So then the daughter, in this case, has to do her own healing and separation. So, um, and then there is a break in that family system you are talking about because of the there is no resolution from the accuser. Most of the time, they are not just, uh, you know, admitting. They, they are in denial, and they explain it away that it wasn't really incest. It was blah, blah. Um, except for the way this work functions that I, that I didn't state, is the thing about opening the soul of the family is that the the soul of the family is what, in my language, I call the field of the heart. And that this field of the heart interconnects everyone in the family and operates beyond space and time. So we, we do this work. The, the father may or may not be present, and quite typically he's not. It's the daughter who's come to do the work, or a mother who's doing the work for the child. Um, there are times when the whole family's there. But the, the family is not standing in as representing their own family. Others are standing in. And that the, the shift that happens in this um, field of the heart, and it's communicated uh, through time and space unwittingly to the perpetrator. And they call, they, there's a change. Um, and it issues from inside them. Sometimes they're absolutely conscious of it, and other times they're not at all. And yet there's an ease in the family. So um, at, the, at the level you're talking, with, within the domain of one's a psychological field, you're right. But at the level of this work, it, it works more deeply. So I, pr I appreciate your... So the system works on an energy field. level then. Mm -hmm. And so... Yeah, yeah, in that aspect, I understand how that works, even if the father or the abuser is not in consent or at present or on denial. Yeah, quite typically, the father's not even conscious of what that, that the family, other people in the family are doing the work. The um, Rupert Sheldrake, a British biologist, who uh, a dozen or 15 years ago wrote a book entitled the hypothesis of formative causation, where he, he wrote of morphic fields, these energetic fields that interconnect uh, people or species, uh, has worked with Hellinger and watched this process and said this is the first type of work that he's, he was aware of where people use these energy fields. Yeah. So uh, in a moment, we're working our way back to this business of relationship. But other questions? Yes, please. I just wondered if um, the concept of forgiveness is at the basis of this work. She asks whether the concept of forgiveness is the basis of this work. Um, actually, the basis of this work is, is love. It's shifting our focus or, or our intention um, from whatever angst we, we have to love. To, to love that flows through the family system. Now, forgiveness, Hellinger had initially had a lot to say in, on forgiveness that 
his, his thinking that I think is relevant, and then I'll come back around specifically to you, is that when one demands um, um, forgiveness from another, one is subordinating themselves to the other. We have the person who can offer forgiveness and the one who longs for forgiveness is putting themselves in a one down position. Do you see the, and the, and the one who is in the position of withholding forgiveness often places themselves above the other. In, in this work, it, it's quite apparent that all life shares the same level in the hierarchy. Now there are, what I mean by hierarchy, moral, ethical, or spiritual. Our, one has no higher place than the other. And yet, forgiveness is, is extraordinarily relevant. Typically, the way it's done in this body of work is the acknowledgment, I've wronged you. The guilt is mine, the burden is mine, leave it with me. And in exchange for the fact that I've wronged you, I give you my remorse. And in other words, I open my heart and I, I, I give you, um, let you know that, that there's grief, um, that um, I won't do it again. And that ha seems to have the same resolution as using forgiveness directly. So I wouldn't say that it's predicated on it, but it is a part of the work. Yeah. And it comes under co to co consenting to what is. Uh, what role does secrets have with affecting and how do you deal with secrets events in the family that may never have been revealed events may have impacted the family that you never got clarity about the facts but they may have had some impact in the constellation his question is about secrets and how you deal with them well firstly in this line of work um, when there is someone in the family with schizophrenia, they're the carrier of the secret. And um, they know it and they can't reveal it. Oftentimes there are, when there are secrets, they may show up in, in the process that something is indeed secret and the soul of the system will either reveal it or it won't. Typically it does not. And the way it's handled is for the, the, the client, the one I'm working with, is to leave all those burdens with those who came before and to literally let go of them and not, no longer carry them. And typically then they have access to their strength and are free. The, as you know, no parent wants their child to be encumbered with your own burden. And that's true of the ancestors or those further back as well. Am I addressing you? Yeah. Um, does this get complicated, or does it work pretty much the same in adoption situations, where if um, you come to, to do some work and you have children, let's say, who are adopted, who come from a different family system than you come from, and yet there's just these huge issues on the table. Who, which family are you working with? Are you working with the, the children's adopted family or your own family? Or if the issues that you're trying to heal are what's going on with the children primarily? In issues in, with adopted children, the adopted child belongs to the to the soul system, the family of their biological parents. They are not a part of the soul of the uh, adoptive parents. They are a part of the adoptive parent psychological family and, and field. Quite typically, a parent will come and say, look, I, I have this child, and this is, these are the issues. What the pattern that shows up typically that the field wants involved, they want the, the biological parents present, they want the adoptive parents present, and quite typically the child is, is standing in the middle lost, not knowing which way to go. 
in their soul, the adoptive parent knows they belong to the biological ones, but their, all their psychological loyalties are to the, to the ones who've adopted them. And they may be really angry. Kids don't do grief, they do anger. Um, they may be really angry over here. Quite typically, there are some statements that create a, create a movement in the soul. And that is when the biological parents honor and acknowledge the adoptive parents for giving to their children what they could not. And then the adoptive parents honor the biological parents for the privilege of loving their children. As that begins to happen, there's a flow of strength for the adoptive child. And there are various other patterns what follows, but typically that's the initial movement. Okay. So we have uh, a few more minutes before we take a break, and then I want, after the break, to, to bring this back around to um, more of a relationship to topic related to this. Uh, I think we have perhaps time for one, or, one more question or so before we take the break. Is there a comment or question or a need? Well, in a way, when a child born into two people, into, you know, into a family, it is basically two family, just like in a situation then in an adoptive situation, because the mother is from one family unit and the father is from one family unit. So if the relationship the, uh, the, between the father and mother is harmonious, they develop a field where the child can feel comfortable. Is that how? Or because then the child still has two family, the mother's and the farmer's, father's sole family. So, the, so that they could be uh, growing up healthy, it's necessary for the uh, energy field of the father and the mother to be in harmonious union? The, um, the energy field of the parents when they have their children, they are um, gonna be a, a nested system within their, their own ancestral lines and their ancestral lines will come together with, with their creation of a child. Um, and the child will be affected by uh, and may be entangled on, on either side of the family or both sides. When, whether the parents are, are harmonious or not, that will affect the child. In that, in this, in this work, we don't have parents, we are our parents. And if, if one parent has contemptuous feelings toward the other parent, the child will have contempt for him or herself. Okay, um, if the family is quite loving and, and, and get along well, the, the child um, will have a lot of strength from their parents. And there may be other entanglements that, that cause them um, great difficulty. But um, from their parents, there'll be great strength. The, um, irrespective of how difficult their family, a child's family of origin is, um, no matter what the circumstances of their family, that is their source of strength. Um, and quite typically, we have a lot of social systems in place that don't recognize that. That um, no matter how, how difficult it is, the strength is there. Addressing you? Okay. So, if I may, I think what we, how many minute break? Um, so let's take a, a 10 minute break. Um, thank you for your questions and we'll loop back through now. It's not, the mic's not on. My mic's not on? I don't think so. Yeah, So maybe we can get some more, a little more volume. Yeah, thank you. So uh, I wanna say just a couple other things about um, what this work is revealing and also healing regarding uh, marriages. In your, and then I, then I think what I'll do is a, a short demonstration. In um, your lifetime, you'll have two families, your family of origin and then your current family. And that another system's imperative is that every member of the family has an equal right to belong. And a question might arise, well, 
who is in my family system in your current in, in, in a current family. In your current family, you have yourself, um, your spouse, all your biological children. All former spouses are a part of your current family. Anyone with whom you've had a pregnancy is part of your, your current family. Uh, and there are times when a fiance, someone whom you've given your heart to, but perhaps neither married nor had children, uh, there are times when they're in your family as well. And when the system, the system's imperative states that every member has an equal right to belong, you may, you may think for a moment that typically how in, in our country what we consider a family, firstly we, we rarely consider a former spouse as part of a family. Perhaps if we've had children with them, they'll, they may or may not have a role. And so what happens if a family member is excluded, say a former spouse, then one of the children of say the second marriage will be unconsciously, unwittingly entangled with that former spouse. And that, that child will carry the energy of the first spouse. And then the relationship that, say, the, the mother had with, it, uh, with her former husband, she, there's now some of that energy between she and that son. And then there's uh, an awkwardness or an energy between the father and that son. And this is all exists outside of their awareness. And then there will be the, the presence, energetic presence, even um, maybe at a distance of that former spouse. And the way that this work often allows for uh, resolution is to re-include that family member by honoring the love that was shared, by honoring that former family member or, or that uh, former spouse uh, as the father of their children. And when the love is honored and when the former spouse is honored as the, the parent of the children, then the last remaining piece is to release the bond that, that held them together with love. And then there can be freedom not only for the, the new couple, but also for their children. And again, it's simply a consenting to what is. Oftentimes people leave marriages in, a, in an acrimonious way. And they're, when we do that, we're busy taking care of ourselves, minding our wounds or something. And unless we acknowledge and honor the love and honor that other person, um, particularly if they were a parent, and then release the bond, then former partners are often with us in, in our ongoing relationship and an impediment. And so it, you need not do a, a constellation involving me or, or some other practitioner if you can legitimately open your heart and literally feel the love that you felt for your former partner. And if they were a parent, honor them for that role. And you might even let them know in, in your heart of hearts that you love the you that you, that you see in your children. You know, I, when you say to an ex-husband, I, I love the you I see in our children. That not only frees you and this other man, but it also begins to free your children. And then release the bond. It, one of the things that Hellinger pointed out uh, differently than perhaps others is that the bonds that form between men and women, there are bonds formed uh, during intercourse, uh, rape or incest, and or the consummation of love. But And the bonds, when one is young, tend to be stronger than bonds that are formed when one is older. So in your uh, early or initial relationships, oftentimes we are bound to this partner in ways we don't understand. Now, from a, a soul perspective, the, these bonds are simply provided by nature to keep a couple together for whatever time they need to be together. 
you can, you can discern the strength of a bond by how difficult it is to extricate yourself from the relationship. And if you've ever had great difficulty getting out of a relationship, it has to do with the strength of the bond. Now, the bonds you form perhaps at 20, and then perhaps later when you're 50 or 60, and you, or 40, 50 or 60, and you have a, a different partner, the bond that is formed then will never be as strong as the earlier bond. How, however, your ability to, to open yourself to love has grown, and then you have the love that's there. And the earlier bonds need to be released. And so if you've ever wondered if maybe it's 20, 30 years and you get a phone call from somebody you've given your heart to when you're quite young, and you know full well it's over, but you, you're also curious at why you respond so strongly to them on the phone. It's just the existence of the bond. So you can, from your own heart, you can, you can get real still and quiet and literally open your heart, honor the love that was there, and release the bond. Even if you, you didn't feel an emotional connection, if there was a pregnancy, there's always love. So freeing yourself so that you, you have um, more of your energy present with your current partner, and then also your children are free from any of those kinds of encumbrances with former partners. So um, I think what I'd like to do, there have been a couple uh, requests to, to demonstrate this work a bit. So if someone has a uh, legitimate heartfelt concern that there is an issue, and given that this, is, um, this topic tonight has sort of been in the direction of a relationship, if there's a, uh, an issue involving um, your partner and yourself that um, you might, that your heart might tell you is, is uh, right to work on here, um, I'll, I'll demonstrate the work. We, we have a little space. I think we have adequate space. Um, so are you interested in a demonstration? Sure. So um, if, if you will, now before, before a volunteer volunteers their issue, I, I want to um, make a couple statements. Firstly, any concern or issue you have belongs to your privacy and the privacy of your family. And I want us to do our utmost to honor the dignity of yourself and your family and, and honor your privacy. Now, there are certainly ways to do this blindly where no one knows any content. And there are times it's really wonderful if somebody doesn't believe in the work and it's important to, to prove it, which I have never found that necessary. But for, for demonstration purposes, there, there may be a little bit of information that others of us will become privy to. So here's what I ask, is go beyond keeping the, the issue or the concern that the other presents. Um, go beyond keeping it confidential. Instead, I want you to literally forget it. You'll watch the demonstration. And if you have had or have any analogous issue in your own life, and if you're sitting in this room connected to your soul, you're going to get some shifts or change yourself. So if you have an epiphany or you have a shift or get some insight, keep it. But if you will literally forget the other story, fair enough? So um, now I will only set a constellation for somebody for whom it's a legitimate, heartfelt concern. If it's an intellectual curiosity, um, I'm not interested. I, this, um, literally, the field of your heart will not open if it's simply an intellectual curiosity. It needs to be a heartfelt concern. So is there some, uh, someone with, with a, a couple's issue or something like that? Um, briefly, what is it? I've been separated from my wife. Is this on? Can you hear them? I've been separated from my wife for about a year and a half. She lives in San Francisco with our 18-year-old daughter. And I've been working to form a new relationship here. I've come across some difficulties. Some, some anger has come up. 
Um, and yet, when I've tried to expert, try to get out of the relationship, the bond has been too tight. So we're, we're back together again now. And you and your wife? No. You and this woman here? Yes. yes. And so what is it you want? What I'd like to do is let go of anything that's impeding the love flow in the new relationship. Any entanglements, I really want. I don't think you know what you're asking for. Come here. you to breathe into your heart a minute just easily with your eyes open please just easily breathe very slowly in and out of your heart how long have you been married to the woman in San Francisco 18 years and you have children with her one daughter who's 18 and how long have you been separated about a year and a half. Any former spouses? No. For her? Yes. Is this her second marriage? It is. So feel your way into your heart. Mm -hmm. And you said a few moments ago that you want a relationship with a woman here. I want you to consult your heart for a moment. What does your heart want? That's what my heart wants. I just returned from a vision quest in the mountains, and I feel like it's coming from a deep spiritual place. My, my desire to be with That's her. That's okay. Yeah. I want you to, um, firstly, before I ask him to select someone to represent some, some of these people that need to be represented, the, what I ask of you, if you stand in as a representative, that you stay very centered in your own body. And I want you to be open and a witness to um, the experiences that, that will be present. I want you to be open to physiological sensations, open to any emotional uh, experiences, and open to any awarenesses that you have. Um, they will not be your own. They'll belong to the person you're representing. I want you to, um, when placed up here, remain uh, standing in silence and simply stay very centered in um, the one you're representing. And if you're invited to serve as a representative, feel free to accept or decline. That's your prerogative. So. Um, I'd like you to select someone to, to represent your uh, wife. Okay. Look around the room. This lady, she I'd like you to select someone to represent her first husband, your, your wife's first husband. Select someone to represent yourself. Okay. And someone to represent the woman here in this town.
See, what, um, what we each carry outside of our awareness is a, an image of the configuration of, of the people in our family. And so what I, what I ask you to do in a moment, I'm going to ask you to, to walk up behind each of these people one at a time and put your hands on their shoulders. And then you're, you're going to let your body place them somewhere in our, our space here. Okay. Now, uh, your intellect won't have a clue how to place them, but your body will know. So um, simply do that. When he puts his hands on your shoulders, what I ask you to do is state aloud who you're representing. And, and state it loudly so people can hear you. And what's your name? Kai. Have a seat wherever you can see. And representatives, if you will, just stay very present with your eyes open. Be aware of any sensations you might have in your body. Any emotions or any awarenesses. first husband of the wife, what are you feeling? I feel left out. <laughs> not part. Not part of the um, situation. Yeah. First wife? I feel a little confused. Yeah, current wife, yes. Confused. Uh-huh. Any, you're feeling confused. Any other? Nervous, like I have energy running through my body. Um, current girlfriend. I feel drawn to him, but I kind of feel like I'm in the middle, and I'm like I'm concerned about how she feels. Kai, um, I feel a little bit of uh, commotion or even restriction in, in right here in the solar plex area. And maybe a little tightness in the chest. If you feel the need to move, go with your movement. Wife, what are you feeling? I miss him. Say it again. I miss him. First husband? Um, I just feel more involved in what's going on now. More involved. Mm -hmm. Did she have any children with this man? She had one son who's, I think he's in his 20s now. Had a son. Yeah. 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 I want you to represent the the son that, with this man. And Kai, what are you feeling? Anything changed? Um, it's just slight. I feel kind of in the middle. I think, yeah. Uh huh. 
Actually, I need, is, do you have a, with this woman, do you have a son or daughter? I have a daughter. Daughter. I need her represented as well. We, so just be here for a moment and you'll, the field will inform you. You'll, you'll know where to go. I'll just give you a second. What's the wife feeling now? I feel much better with my whole family here. Yeah. And more open to her. Yeah, what else? There's something else. I feel like I want us all to um, be together in some way. Mm -hmm. These two. Something here. There's something with my kids. Right. <sighs> And something with my husband's also. Any change for you? Um, I feel better when she walked over. When your daughter came in, uh-huh. Yeah, I feel like, you know, like the solar plex thing is just, you know, not really even there anymore. Uh-huh. This woman? Um, I have a little bit of a headache. It feel, I have a feeling of a, like this is a lot to deal with. <laughs> and I, I feel a lot of compassion for the wife. You feel compassion for the wife? Yeah, or, you know, concern, or I'm almost more drawn to her than him in a way, or just my attention is there. This last statement, I almost feel more drawn to her than to him. Every constellation that I've ever done with former spouses, the, the current spouse or the current partner always has an allegiance to the former partner. There's always a loyalty. And the uh, first husband, what are you feeling? Any change? Um, I feel like I have a big family now. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, I feel... I feel like, uh, I feel more loved, actually, with, with the kids around. And uh -huh. even though they're not mine. One of them's not. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I feel ignored. Well. Um, no, I did feel that. I feel really drawn to my mother. Um, I feel hollow inside. I'm afraid of my father and in awe of him and want to be closer to him. Can you hear her? Can we have more gain on this handheld? Go ahead. I feel really drawn to my mother. I feel a hollowness inside. I feel afraid of my father. And at the same time, in awe of him, I want to be closer to him. And that's a son, correct? The first, first child's a son. If there's a movement, move at will. Notice where the wife goes and stands. She stands next to her former partner as though she were a current spouse. It's, it's, well, I won't tell you what it's indicative of. We'll find out. What are you feeling? I'm not done with him. Yeah. Now, I'll explain it later. This child, what are you feeling? I'm very sad. I'm very sad. <laughs> yeah. So I need you to look at one another. And just look. I'm going to offer you some words, and if they're true, I want you to state them. I never left you. I never left you.
What are you feeling? I love you. I wasn't strong enough to stay. I wasn't strong enough to stay. What are you feeling? Uh, rings true. Feels true. Rings true. See, we know in our soul, we know in our heart, even if we've been with a partner for 18 years, we know of other allegiances, even though they may not be intellectually defensible. I honor you as the father of our son. I honor you as the father of our son. And I honor the love we shared. And I honor the love that we shared. What's the father feeling? Um, I feel like that was definitely needed. Uh, that I feel more fulfilled that that was said. Yeah, you feel yeah. better that that was said. It was. So, mm -hmm. so did it ring true to you? Yes, it did. And I, I felt like I felt like responding back the same way. Yeah. So tell her, I wasn't strong. I wasn't strong enough either. I wasn't strong enough either. And just stay silent here. There's another, but I, there's another. Some more words. I have to wait for them. Is hiking allowed? <laughs> I want you to move over here for a minute. Why don't you go stand next to him? You can put your arm around her. What are you feeling? Um, pretty happy, actually. You know, I feel pretty good about it. So look at her. I'm going to give you some words to say. I wronged you too. I wronged you too. I knew who had your heart. I knew who had your heart. What are you feeling? I love you too. Now I feel. No, no, just a second. See, there, there are statements that are made at a psychological level that are appropriate to say, but they have no impact on the soul. That was one of them. I love you, too. It's in just a second. So what are you feeling? What do you feel in your body? Space. Space. What else? Openness, lightness, receptivity, freedom. So this feels right? Yes. Right. Yes. So tell him this, I wronged you. I wronged you. I've never given you my heart. I've never given you my heart. That burden is mine to carry, leave it with me. That burden is mine to carry, leave it with me. 
That guilt is mine. That guilt is mine. I leave what is yours with you. I leave what is yours with you. I wronged you too. I wronged you too. I'll carry what is mine. I'll carry what is mine. I wronged you early on and recently. I wronged you early on and recently. Those are mine, not yours. Those are mine, not yours. What's this child feeling? Relieved. Relieved. Very relieved. I'm breathing easier. See, the children know everything that's going on too, even though they're not conscious of it. And the typical response as these shifts occur is simply stating what is, is relief. The burden, the energy can dissipate. What's this child feeling? I feel a measure of relief, but I'm still feeling uh, angry and alone and neglected. Sure. <coughs> Stand by your pop for just a minute. Oops. Sorry, to, didn't mean to hit you in the jaw. Come here. This man is your father. Tell her. This man is your father. That man doesn't concern you. That man doesn't concern you. What's between your father and me is ours, not yours. What's between your father and me is ours, not yours. Our love is yours, nothing more. Our love is yours, nothing more. Your father is an honorable man. Your father is an honorable man. What's the son feeling? I felt a whole lot of sadness, but as she spoke to me, I'm feeling like I can breathe easier. Can you hear her? <coughs> Just a little more gain on the handheld, please. Go ahead. Again? Yeah. I said I was feeling a lot of sadness well up, and as you spoke to me, I can breathe easier, and I just want to look at him. There seems to be an imperative in this work that sons be next to their fathers. A son gets strength to be the kind of spouse he'd like to be or to be the kind of father he'd like to be or do the work in the world directly from his father and the men on, in the family. A woman gets her strength to be the kind of spouse she wants to be, the kind of parent she wants to be, or gets her strength to do work in her world via her mother from her father. But she gets her strength from her mother to be the kind of spouse, to be the kind of parent. So women, it works best if they're metaphorically standing next to their mother and men next to their father. When, when little children we have, a, when, when there's a daddy's girl or there is a mama's boy, there is a transition that is really helpful that they make fairly early in their life to stand next to the same gender parent so they'll have a, a different kind of strength available to them. And so this business of this mother acknowledging this man as the father and stating that he's honorable, in this case, is what this, this son needed so that he could breathe easier and he likes looking at his father. 
What are you feeling? I feel a much better connection with uh, my son, obviously. And I feel like there's a lot more balance in this family here. Mm-hmm. What are you feeling, son? I'm feeling a lot less sad, a lot less angry. I'm feeling rooted, and I want to stand next to him, though. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. I just want to give a little sidebar here. It's pretty anomalous for this to happen, where the wife literally wants to stand there. It happens, but infrequently. Typically, when there are the acknowledgments made, there's a shift. And she realizes that she's done. But she hadn't known it before. And there are times when she, she experiences, sometimes it's the man, but in this case, we're referring to a woman, that she experiences for the first time the heartbreak because she finally has let him go, even after all these years. How are you doing standing here? When my son stood next to him, I felt myself start to move away. Look at this. She starts to move away. Yeah. We'll find out. So look at him. I honor you as the mother of our child. I honor you as the mother of our child. And I honor the love we shared. And I honor the love that we shared. And through our son, we are connected always as parents. And through our son, we are connected always as parents. But no longer as partners. But no longer as partners. So I release you and let you go with love. So I release you and let you go with love. See, there is a ton, there, oftentimes we're fooled. We think we really are invested in the former partner. And we are until all the truths that were unstated are stated. Rarely, there are times when it happens, but it seems to be very rare. What are you feeling here? I feel heartbreak, um, and I feel complete. I feel finished in a way. I feel free in a way. Yeah. So tell them, I release you as well. I release you as well. With love. With love. And the sun, what do you feel? My muscles feel relaxed, and I feel peaceful. Yeah. So there's a movement available. Go move at will. I'm smiling because this is a, a kind of a typical pattern. What's this child feeling? I want with him what they have. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so look here. Do I have a few minutes to go over? We've got about six, minute re six minutes remaining. Ten minutes. Um, well, I'm going to I'm going to press on with this. So, what are you feeling? What's going on in your body? I feel ready to leave. Yeah. What are you feeling? Um, kind of mixed uh, emotions. What are what's the mix of emotions? In a way, I feel kind of relieved, but kind of like maybe it's, you know, weighs on the heart or something. Yes, it weighs on the heart. Mm -hmm. 
I honor you as the father of our child. I honor you as the father of our child. And I honor the love we shared. And I honor the love we shared. And through our child, we're connected always. And through our child, we're connected always. But no longer as partners. But no longer as partners. I release you. I release you. And let you go. And let you go. With love. With love. What are you feeling? I feel good. I feel good about that. You feel good about that? Yeah. But also there's, be very gentle. There's a very tender heart here because the movement's happening. I honor you as the mother of our child. I honor you as the mother of our child. And honor our love. And honor our love. And I release you. And I release you. With love. With love. I need you to stand here for a moment. <laughs> Look at your mom and dad for a minute. Tell your daughter, what's between your mother and me? What's between your mother and me? Is ours, not yours. Is ours, not yours. Leave it with us. Leave it with us. Only take our love. Only take our love. What are you feeling? I'm pissed. Yeah, you're pissed. Yeah. yeah. Of course. <laughs> And you. Stand next to your brother. Yeah. How do you feel now? It's better. <laughs> Just stand there next to her. By the mother being here, it gives her some strength. So it's been a long wait. What's this? <laughs> What's this woman feel? Well, I had a really distinct feeling like there's not a lot of room for me here. <laughs> and I mean, I kind of feel some energy with him. But when I started feeling more and he looked more appealing is when he started feeling emotion about the other relationship. So I was surprised. Can you hear her? Yes. Okay, great. So when he started showing, like when his heart was expressing his feelings, I was like, ooh, I like him. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> so stand next to him and, and check out which side of him you want to stand on. Find out what it feels like on this side. Find out what it feels like on the other side. When I talked earlier about hierarchy, there's also this phenomenon of placement. Who's next to whom? Has, has everything to do with the movement of love through a family. What do you, you're over here. Yeah. Yeah. What are you feeling? I feel pretty good. I feel clear. Uh -huh. Yeah. I feel nice. Uh-huh. And you? Feels a lot better. I mean, that ought to. So just turn your head and look at her and tell her, I'm here now. I'm here now. He's almost here. <laughs> <laughs> That's not a, that, that is not entirely true yet. So he's, he's freer from his family, 
but he's they're still he's still moving into this reality. So look at her and say, we'll see. We'll see. Yes, we'll see. Yes, we'll see. What's this child feeling? I'm feeling very happy. I like this one next to me. I'm not sure that this one likes me kind of glomming onto him so much, but that's okay. And this child? I'm better. Uh -huh. It feels, I feel much more, I just had a connection with dad when this just happened. Whatever that was, there was something that feels like it kind of dropped away between he and I. Uh-huh. And this wife? I feel good. Good. Lots of love. And this husband, first husband? I don't feel like I have much of a relationship with him. Yeah. And I think that that would heal things faster. That's, abs that's actually true. So look at him. You are first. You are first. I am second. I am second. I'm in your debt. I'm in your debt. By your leaving, there was room for me. By your leaving, there is room for me. I'm second. I'm second. And don't forget it. <laughs> he said, and don't forget it. <laughs> That's a guy thing, by the way. <laughs> but there was a shift with everybody. What did you feel when that was stated? Mm. Grief. Um, I'm not sure if it's personal or if it's... Um, no, it's here in this here field. And it's personal. Yeah. It's, Stand and balance your weight and, and stay here and, okay. and then respond. Gratitude. Gratitude, yeah. Any change with you? Yeah, I feel like um, doing more with him so both families can be more connected. Go fishing or something. To something. Yeah. yeah. I'm a vegetarian, but. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to go, go hiking instead. Yeah. <laughs> so stay, stay, no. stay here for a second. Stay in this role. What do you feel? I like that. Yeah. There's one other thing he needs. Um, he needs his father here. And behind him, his father. And behind him, his father. Then he'll have strength. Whenever a woman is in trouble with a man, she needs her mother. Whenever a man is in trouble with women, he needs the father. Or just life. Because, there, again, that strength that flows through the ancestry. So... Um, Thank you all. Step out of your roles, please. Leave the energy here. Thank you for uh, working, giving to this man. Now, one thing, if I may, um, it will serve the healing for yourself and your family to avoid analyzing this, avoid talking about it, and simply open your heart to the changes. The, the additional piece you can do is sometime when you're home alone or some, something, imagine your father standing before you and his father behind him and his father behind him and prostrate yourself with your palms up and open your heart in gratitude for that man giving you life. And it'll, it'll give you more strength. Yeah. Great. So um, I'm, o I'm a few minutes over, obviously. However, before um, I hand over the mic, are there any comments or questions? Is there anything wanting to be said or needing to be heard? Yeah. How do you do this? Um, flip it up higher. 
the top one. Okay, okay. How do you do this work um, when there's not a, you don't have a whole group of people to, to pull from? Well, um, this can be adapted. I adapted it for the first year I did this. I worked with some 350 individuals and never did it in a group and then only afterwards. So it, it can be done individually, oh. either through putting paper around or through hypnosis. Lots, lots of ways to okay. do it. Okay. Other needs or questions? Comments? Yeah. Why do you not use him to play himself? I don't quite get why he's just a witness here rather than a participant. Rarely, very rarely, the um, I would use I could use a client, but quite typically um, their own understandings get in the way. That their own um, beliefs or stories that told they've told themselves over the years um, seem to carry more weight to them than what what the real dynamic is. The it's more than adequate for them to if they're sitting and being attentive and they're present. Um, all the work is happening in their soul, and um, they'll remember the images. Yeah. Once in a while, the field will inform, stand the person in, so I stand them in. Yeah. I follow the, the, the movement of the field rather than, than the, what, the patterns I'm aware of or what I know. My job is to have the integrity to keep myself out of this and my understandings out of this and simply be informed by the field in, in a similar way to the representatives being informed of what the experience is. Anything else? The question I have has to do with um, what we were talking before about abuse. Mm -hmm. And how would the work work with somebody, let's say, because they haven't acknowledged it, um, if there was an abuse going on and then they haven't, you haven't actually, the person who was the abuser hadn't acknowledged that or took responsibility and they continued the cycle of abuse, what would happen then? What, how would this work? Um, I need you to be clear if I'm going to okay. with, formulate um, your question very well. Okay. If the, way I, the way I look at it is a lot of people continue the cycle of abuse that's happened to them unless they're strong enough to overcome it oh, in some uh -huh. ways. Okay. Um, so that cycle will continue. So if you're working with this and then there's an actual shift within that person who is the victim, um, but the person who is the perpetrator never was really confronted and, or never really took responsibility for what's happening, um, and they continue that cycle of abuse, how, how would you deal with that and what would you do to address that, in that sense? Well, I want to remind you that this work, um, this work will affect the, the one continuing to, the, the perpetrator, uh, even though he wasn't involved. And, and how that work works is it simply moves to the field and we don't understand how the process works. So the, if I work with the victim and, and not the perpetrator, the, victim, uh, the perpetrator will be affected. Um, there are various ways that when doing field work, sometimes the, the shift is immediate and it's palpable and, and the person knows it. Other times the shift is very incremental. Uh, other times there may be a, a, a point where It'll, there'll be a, a time delay, and then the person will be conscious of a choice that they are now in a position to make. They may have been aware of alternatives before, but never been in a place of actually exercising an alternative. But they're, in a, 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 they're at a place where they can literally make a choice and, and make a change. Um, ecology has taught us one thing. When working with systems, you cannot do one thing. So I work with the victim. The perpetrator is affected. He may um, stop, if he's continuing to the cycle, he may stop right away, he may not. Um, I worked with a woman in a, in a couple's constellation and pornography showed up. So I stood pornography in, somebody to represent pornography and the constellation resolved, that was on a Saturday. On Monday I got an, I'm sorry, the fall, next Friday I got an email from her and she said, um, I hadn't told you this but my husband was involved with pornography. On Monday, he canceled all his online subscriptions to pornography. And I never told him anything about the work we had done. So this, this work works outside of our awareness and moves through these fields of our interconnection. 
So um, it may affect him, it may not. So um, thank you for your attentiveness. I want to close with a poem, and then I'll be around if, any, if there are other questions or thoughts. Hafiz. We have not come here to take prisoners, but to surrender ever more deeply to freedom and joy. We have not come to this exquisite world to hold ourselves hostage from love. Run, my dear, from anything that may not strengthen your precious budding wings. Run like hell, my dear, from anyone likely to put a sharp knife into the sacred, tender vision of your beautiful heart. We have a duty to befriend those aspects of our obedience that stand outside of our house and shout to our reason, oh please, oh please, come out and play. For we have not come here to take prisoners or to confine our wondrous spirits, but to experience ever and ever more deeply our divine courage, freedom, and light. Thank you for um, your generous attention in this warm evening. Be well. RVML Resource Center is a volunteer-operated federal 501c3 tax-exempt nonprofit organization. RVML is dedicated to providing easy access to a comprehensive collection of information on a variety of metaphysical, spiritual, and personal development subjects. RVML accepts and appreciates all donations. Material and monetary contributions are fully tax-deductible. This recording is not copyrighted and permission is granted to broadcast, exhibit, or duplicate all or part of this program for non-commercial educational purposes. This live presentation was organized and presented by the Rogue Valley Metaphysical Library and Event Center. For more information, please visit rvml.org.